The terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, served as a rude wake-up call to America. Terrorism was not an irritant that would just go away. In a few short moments that morning, this became crystal clear. President George W. Bush announced from the rubble of the Twin Towers to a stunned and outraged nation that freedom and democracy are under attack. In a manner akin to Franklin D. Roosevelt's address to the Congress following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Bush subsequently declared war on terrorism. Further, he warned the nation that freedom and fear are at war and there will be no quick or easy end to this conflict. Secretary of State Colin Powell indicated that the scope of tools used to wage this new war would be all-encompassing. Supporting this, Powell said, we and our coalition partners must be prepared to conduct a campaign with every tool of statecraft, political, diplomatic, legal, economic, financial, intelligence, and when necessary, military. A key element to that military response is air power. Air power brings unique capabilities to the war on terror. It offers a flexible, timely strike capability including a new generation of highly discriminate weapons. Air power also affords the least politically risky of the military options for striking back at terror. Because it does not entail putting troops on the ground or moving significant naval assets into harm's way. Moreover, the high speed of response associated with air power will become increasingly important as terrorists acquire the capabilities to move swiftly from one theater to another and to attack with little or no warning. Thus, the United States Air Forces, with the strike capabilities afforded by air-launched cruise missiles and other smart munitions, should be considered a natural leading element in any proactive strategy for countering terror. Beyond direct bombardment, these air assets can provide tactical mobility for special forces teams and give them close support should they be called upon to strike directly at key terrorist nodes. America's counter-terrorism approach has changed. One impetus for this change is the 9-11 attacks. The fact is, we've been getting shot at for the last 30 to 40 years. The weaker they think you are, the more they'll go after you. Anybody who teaches international relations, or almost anybody, I think would tell you that during the Cold War and the first decade after the Cold War, uh, terrorism was one of those topics that you put at the end of the syllabus um, when you're teaching, because if there's a snowstorm or something and you run out of time, terrorism is one of those issues that you could relatively safely cut, because from the perspective of global politics, it's a fly. Great power politics is the central part of international relations as a study. And, uh, you know, we're talking about the Cold War era and U.S. Soviet politics dominated. Terrorism was a secondary issue, basically. And even at the end of the Cold War, uh, you know, there were bigger fish to fry, so to speak. There were questions about genocide. There was war in Europe again, right? So terrorism has long been a secondary issue. And, and I think part of that is uh, just because of the effects of terrorism. It is a horrible thing when there are victim, innocent victims of terrorism, and most of the victims are innocent people, um, but quantitatively it adds up to uh, dog bites, deaths and falls from uh, bathtubs, things like that. that. You know, until September 11, 2001, terrorism was really on the backwater. Now, since 2001, almost everybody in the field has had to think a lot more seriously about terrorism. So to the extent that I've thought about terrorism, it's mostly been in the context of the last decade. This new aggressive approach to counterterrorism has been labeled the Bush Doctrine, which makes it clear that terrorists of global reach will be sought, targeted, and preemptively engaged. The Bush Doctrine was the idea that um, to enhance or to ensure American national security, we might need to take preemptive action in certain cases. In other words, if a country uh, is getting to the point where it is threatening uh, enough to our security that we are not simply going to wait for an attack uh, and then respond to it, but that we might move in preemptively uh, and uh, eliminate the threat.
to us. And that was articulated by Condoleezza Rice, who was national security advisor at that time. And um, it really it upset a lot of people. But I'd suggest great powers do that in any event. It may not be smart to go ahead and announce it, just as I don't think it was terribly smart of the president to talk about an axis of evil. Uh, things like that don't get you very far. Um, but great powers would tend to reserve that right of preemptive strike to themselves in any case. I'm not sure, though, that you need to advertise it. After the September 11th, uh, 2001 attacks, um, there was some serious thinking in Washington about, you know, what should the U.S. do sort of after Afghanistan about these lingering problems of terrorism and uh, the potential that terrorism uh, might uh, be something much bigger than the problem of dog bites or uh, um, bathtub falls, right? That the, that the scale perhaps had changed. And the, the way that terrorism becomes a game-changing event is probably if it's linked to nation states that could provide it resources, financial support, technological support, et cetera. And if particularly if those states, um, often at that time and through the 90s, called rogue states, you know, sort of outlaw states, that if they were pursuing weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, biological weapons, and worst possible of all, nuclear weapons. So if, the, if there was a nexus between these things, states that sponsor terrorism and states that are developing weapons of mass destruction, what happens if those, thing, those things all come together and they decide to build these weapons and give them the, to the terrorists to use to basically advance their foreign policy without having to suffer necessarily the direct blame for that policy. And so that's what I think became the central idea driving what became the Bush Doctrine, which was the idea that the U.S might preventively use force, although the language was usually preemptively because for international law purposes preemption has long been seen as legal while prevention is much more dubious, but it essentially was a preventive policy to prevent these things long before they happen because by the time there's a smoking gun or worse a mushroom cloud then it's too late right so you have to you, you you can't predict the activity of terrorists in the same way that you can predict hopefully the activity of nation states nation states have territory and peoples and they can be deterred hopefully and that's long been the idea of US foreign policy you know vis-a-vis -vis different kinds of threats i mean that was central to containment which was not only a policy used during the cold war to stop soviet expansion but which was actually a policy, a dual containment of Iran and Iraq during the 1990s. So containment is a you know, flexible policy that can try to you know, prevent bad things from happening. But how do you prevent terrorists when you don't even know where they are? They could be hiding. They're, you know, they're, they're intentionally trying to disguise themselves. So uh, um, when you have that particular motive, trying to stop that particular strain of what George W. Bush called evil, if you have to try to constrain that form of evil in, in that particular guise, then that was the justification for the Bush Doctrine, which could be targeted against their state sponsors. According to President Bush, we cannot defend America and our friends by hoping for the best. This doctrine is still U.S. policy today. I don't think there's any way that the Obama administration will use the phrase the Bush Doctrine to justify any kind of particular policies, but uh, during the campaign, for instance, when both Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, and it's important because Hillary Clinton is now the Secretary of State, that when both of them were asked questions about what they would do about possible threats, Pakistan and the fact that they have nuclear weapons and have sometimes been tied to insurgencies in Kashmir and to the Taliban in Afghanistan that, uh, you know, or Iran, what would they do about these particular threats? I mean, essentially, they've made the same kinds of threats that the Bush administration was making, meaning that if they had, uh, I mean, they've tried to make caveats, but if they had actionable intelligence that these kinds of threats were fomenting, then they might take essentially the same kind of preventive action that the U.S. said it was taking in the case of Iraq. Which, which is to say that, you know, the idea that the U.S. might strike Iran out of fear that it's developing nuclear weapons and out of fear that it might pass them along to terrorists, you know, that's essentially still on the table. So even though the Bush administration is gone and the language of the Bush doctrine has been altered, the underlying policy, I think, is, is still on central stage in Washington. According to the Department of Defense, 
The new priority will be first to disrupt and destroy terrorist organizations of global reach and attack their leadership, command, control and communications, material support and finances. The DOD contends that to execute preemptive action, we will continue to transform our military forces to ensure our ability to conduct rapid and precise operations to achieve decisive results. Air power with its inherent speed, range, stealth, and precision weapons employment capabilities will be an important tool to support this new Bush doctrine. According to Title 22 of the United States Code, Section 2656F, D30, terrorism means remediated, politically motivated violence perpetrated against non-combatant targets by subnational groups or clandestine agents usually intended to influence an audience. Well, there's this old line that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, right? Uh, it's kind of a cliche in international politics, but anytime there are debates about, say, defining terrorism, like at the United Nations, there's vast disagreement about exactly what constitutes a terrorist. Uh, the U.S. Uh, tends to think about it as um, basically a criminal action committed by non-state actors um, with uh, innocence as their victim, right, that, uh, for political purposes. Um, and I, I think that's a relatively defensible definition, and uh, it serves across eras, but I think the real difference from September 11th was the idea that, that uh, terrorism could dramatically change in scale. I mean, certainly incidents of terrorism had, had global effects previously. I mean, you know, the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand was one of the key factors building up to World War I. Um, and, you know, other acts of terrorism, even acts of terrorism committed, say, by the, by the Nazis in the brown shirts before they came to power in, in Germany, right? So, I mean, acts of terrorism can have big political effects in, in many different contexts. Um, but what 9-11 did was, number one, it made the U.S., you know, a central target, um, uh, not necessarily for the first time, but, you know, the homeland and changing the context and such big prominent targets, I mean, that was a, a, a big transformative uh, effect. And, and secondly, just the, the scope of the, of the damage, the thousands of people who died, the buildings collapsing, you know, the Pentagon under attack. I mean, that, that was a transformative moment in, the, in thinking about terrorism. Comprehending these terms and their meanings is central in describing the air power strategies that can be employed against an opponent. First is punishment strategies that seek to inflict enough pain on enemy civilians to overwhelm their territorial interest in the dispute. The hope is that the government will concede or the population will revolt. The punishment approach was first stated in the early days of air power, where such air power leaders as Julio Duhay, Sir Hugh Trenchard, and the officers assigned to the U.S. Air Corps Tactical School believed that air power could influence the will of the people. The second air power strategy is risk. The heart of this strategy is to raise the risk of civilian damage slowly, compelling the opponent to concede to avoid suffering future costs. While the punishment strategy applies overwhelming force in all-out attacks, the risk strategy holds what the enemy cherishes as hostage and relies upon a gradual escalation of force. Critical to the risk approach is that the coercer must signal clearly that the bombing is contingent on the opponent's behavior and will be stopped upon compliance with the coercer's demands. The American Rolling Thunder bombing campaign in Vietnam from 1965 to 1968 serves as an excellent example of a risk strategy. A more recent example of a risk strategy was the use of air power in 1999 that compelled the former Serbian leader Slobodan Milosevic to agree to NATO demands regarding Serbian involvement in Kosovo. The third air power strategy is denial. This entails smashing enemy military forces, weakening them to the point where friendly ground forces can seize disputed territories without suffering unacceptable losses. 
Denial campaigns generally center on destruction of arms manufacturing, interdiction of supplies from home front to battlefront, disruption of movement and communication in theater, and attrition of fielded forces. A recent example of a denial campaign is the initial use of air power in Afghanistan in Operation Enduring Freedom. In that case, air power helped to destroy Taliban forces and removed Al-Qaeda's state supporter and resultant safe haven. The fourth air power strategy is decapitation, the use of air power for decapitation, a strategy spawned by precision guided munitions and used against Iraq. These are strikes against key leadership and telecommunications facilities. The main assumption is that these targets are a modern state's Achilles heel. One advantage of decapitation via air power is that direct targeting of leadership with precision guided munitions does not necessarily entail large force on force scenarios, thereby minimizing cost, damage and loss of life. An early case of air power versus terrorism was carried out in 1916 by the U.S. Army Air Service's 1st Aero Squadron while helping search for Pancho Villa. Mexico was embroiled in conflict by different factions fighting for power. Having been ousted from power, Villa and his supporters fled to regroup in northern Mexico. United States President Woodrow Wilson dealt a blow to Villa's cause by recognizing his opponent, Venustiano Carranza, as the legitimate ruler of Mexico. Villa knew that his only hope for victory lay in forcing American intervention in Mexico, which he in turn hoped would trigger a revolt among the peasants of Chihuahua, many of whom regarded the charismatic guerrilla leader as a folk hero. With this in mind, Villa and a large band of horsemen stopped a train in Mexico on January 11, 1916, and executed 19 of the Americans on board. Two months later, Villa's men crossed into Columbus, New Mexico, and killed 17 Americans and lay fire to the town. After panic erupted along the border, President Wilson asked Carranza for permission to send U.S. troops into the territory, to which Carranza agreed but stipulated that the mission was for the sole purpose of capturing the bandit, Villa. Wilson ordered General John Blackjack Pershing and a force of over 6,000 soldiers south of the border to pursue Villa. One of Pershing's first acts was to order the 1st Aero Squadron to New Mexico. They arrived at a forward base on the border on March 13, 1916. It is ironic that given the peerless status of the United States Air Force today, in 1913, just three years prior to the Mexico campaign, the United States came in 13th in the world rankings of air power. The squadron flew into Mexico, where it operated until February 1917. A forward base was established at Colonia Dublon, the field headquarters of the expedition near Nueva Casas Grandes in northern Chihuahua. The 1st Aero Squadron's commanding officer, Captain Benjamin Fuloy, led a well-intentioned but ill-prepared and poorly equipped group of fledgling aviators into the first American air combat endeavor. One of the squadron pilots, Edgar Gorell, noted that the squadron was in horrible shape. The airplanes were not fit for military service, especially along the border. Some of us carried pistols, and two flyers had 22 rifles. The squadron's 90-horsepower Curtis JN-3 airplanes were unable to climb over the 10,000 to 12,000-foot mountains of the region or overcome the high winds of the passes through them. Dust storms frequently grounded the aircraft, and wooden propellers delaminated in the heat. The squadron carried mail and dispatches, flew limited reconnaissance, and acted as liaison between Pershing and forward units. By April 20th, only two airplanes remained in service, four having crashed and two others scavenged to provide replacement parts. 
Four new Curtis N-8 airplanes were delivered on April 22nd, but they were little better than the JN-3s, which they closely resembled, and were soon transferred to North Island as trainers. Another Curtis airplane, the R-2, was sent to the 1st Aero Squadron, with 12 delivered by late May. The R-2 was the latest type available, but it too proved unsatisfactory for use on the border. Between March 15th and August 15th, 1916, the 1st Aero Squadron flew 540 missions in Mexico. Untested aviation procedures, maintenance problems, crashes, a hostile climate, and an indigenous population proved formidable obstacles. The squadron had a relatively minor impact on the campaign, and Villa was never captured. The significance of this event in history is not the mission effectiveness of this campaign, but rather that it was America's first air power foray into these types of operations, something that air power is well suited to execute today. We Americans are slow to anger. We always seek peaceful avenues before resorting to the use of force. And we did. We tried quiet diplomacy, public condemnation, economic sanctions, and demonstrations of military force. None succeeded. Despite our repeated warnings, Gaddafi continued his reckless policy of intimidation, his relentless pursuit of terror. He counted on America to be passive. He counted wrong. By the early 1980s, relations between Libya and America had soured. Secretary of Defense Caspar W. Weinberger typified Washington's view of the Libyan leader by describing him as a theatrically posturing fake mystic with a considerable dollop of madness thrown in. Events set Washington and Tripoli on a collision course for violence. When the collision did occur, the world was shocked. Despite years of agonizing Western debate about combating terrorism, months of mostly fruitless diplomatic maneuvering, weeks of U.S. warnings, and finally days of ominous silence, the world still seemed unprepared when the bombers struck. In 1981, Muammar Mohammed al-Gaddafi had been the Libyan leader for 12 years. For years, Gaddafi had been spending Libya's oil and gas earnings to build a robust military. Gaddafi had long maintained claims that he controlled the entire Gulf of Sidra, the great body of Mediterranean water that lies between Tripoli and Benghazi, north of Libya, and that everything within the Gulf should be considered Libyan territory. When Gaddafi issued his famous proclamation that the line below 32 degrees, 30 minutes, would be enforced as a line of death, Weinberger concluded that we would have to ignore these claims and continue planned naval exercises for that region. Tensions continued to rise until 1986, when the U.S. Navy began its 19th exercise in the area since 1981. It was the eighth time that American forces would operate below the 32 degrees, 30 minutes line. On March 24th, portions of the U.S. Navy's Task Force 60, under the command of Vice Admiral Frank B. Kelso, crossed Gaddafi's line of death. This time, the Libyan leader chose to defend his claimed territory in earnest. When the U.S. Navy decided to depart above the line of death three days later, it left behind several sunken Libyan warships, as well as one destroyed SA-5 missile battery. President Reagan reminded the world that the American exercises in the Gulf of Sidra were standard procedure. So it wasn't an unusual thing we set out to do, and he did open hostilities, and we closed them. Gaddafi now turned to the use of terrorism to try to secure some advantage, 
and escape from the continued humiliation he suffered as the world perceived how idle his threats were. Three days after the U.S. Navy departed, Gaddafi called upon all Arabs to seek revenge against the Americans, including, in his own words, any interest, goods, ship, plane, or person. In 1986, Gaddafi was certainly not new to the world of terrorism. Besides training over 8,000 terrorists annually, Libya provided them with the ways and means to execute their attacks. Gaddafi had enlisted the aid of international terrorist Abu Nidal and his Fatah Revolutionary Council. Nidal and his FRC had a string of horrendous terrorist accomplishments, from the 1972 murder of Israeli Olympic athletes to the Christmas 1985 murders in the Rome and Vienna airports that killed 19 and wounded 117 innocent travelers. Gaddafi praised these attacks and acknowledged that he sheltered members of the FRC. Terrorism was becoming more of a problem. Western nations were becoming increasingly alarmed at the frequency and severity of these attacks. American actions to stop the escalating terror had been nonviolent. President Reagan received little international support to pressure Gaddafi to change his ways. On January 7, 1985, he imposed economic sanctions on Libya and asked for Western European nations to follow suit. The European leaders ignored Reagan's request. The exasperated Reagan administration had had enough. Within days of the battle in the Gulf of Sidra, a senior U.S. official vowed, the next act of terrorism will bring the hammer down on Libya. Before President Reagan could authorize the use of force against Libya, he required direct proof to secure domestic support. When this proof came, the American military would be ready. Libya provided the smoking gun required by President Reagan for military retaliation. American intelligence intercepts revealed that Gaddafi and his regime were instructing their terror organizations to attack locations where Americans congregated. On Friday evening, April 4, 1985, the East Berlin Libyan Embassy sent Tripoli a cable declaring, we have something planned that will make you happy. It will happen soon, the bomb will blow, American soldiers must be hit. In the early morning hours of the next day, a Libyan place bomb exploded in the La Belle Club discotheque that was a favorite of American servicemen. The blast killed two American soldiers and a Turkish woman and wounded 229 others, of which 79 were Americans. Shortly after the blast, American intelligence decoded another message sent to Tripoli from the Libyan embassy in East Berlin, saying, an event occurred, you will be pleased with the result. Secretary of State George Shultz told Reagan, we've taken enough punishment and beating, we have to act. Defense Secretary Weinberger said, in short, this time we have our proof, and so we decided to give the focused response to terrorism that we had always planned to deliver when our proof was clear. President Reagan said, we had irrefutable proof that Colonel Gaddafi was responsible for bombing the disco and that we had to show him he couldn't get away with such things. Reportedly, the president told an aide on April 7th that it was time to make the world smaller for the terrorists. Now that the decision to act had been made, time became a crucial factor. Gaddafi, reacting to reports in the American press of the possibility of military retaliation, raised the possibility of seizing Americans and European citizens in Libya as hostages and moving them on to likely U.S. strike objectives. Among American allies, only the British supported military action. Their decision would play a critical role in planning and executing Operation El Dorado Canyon. 
It quickly became apparent that the military response could best be carried out by air power. It was the only option seriously considered. Remembering the poor results that occurred during the previous U.S. Navy attacks in Lebanon, President Reagan gave Vice Admiral Kelso control of the planning and execution of the attack. This time, there would be little outside interference. Each target would be clearly associated with the Libyan-employed, Libyan-trained terrorists and with all possible precautions to avoid any casualties or danger to civilians. Five targets were selected. Four dealt directly with Gaddafi's terrorism operations and the fifth was struck to protect the strike force. The level of punishment sought drove the strike force composition. The administration wanted the attack to cause significant damage to the targets. It was felt that a pinprick attack would have negligible deterrent value and it might be turned by Gaddafi into a victory for Libya. The strike force needed to be robust and would have to occur at night. The 6th Fleet only had 20 A6s on hand for the attack. The need to deliver precision munitions at night ruled out the FA-18s and A7s. This precision delivery requirement was driven by the desire to minimize civilian casualties. To fill the gap, Air Force General Rogers offered the use of F-111s stationed in the United Kingdom. He also wanted potential foes to know that the threat of U.S. air power was not limited to the times when the U.S. fleet was close by. The F-111s provided something else as well. The press, the Libyans, and the world were transfixed on the 6th Fleet. Vice Admiral Kelso recognized that he could not hide the significant American naval movements from the press. While the Libyans were anticipating a strike from the U.S. Navy, they were not suspecting a backdoor, low-level ingress from the F-111s. Masterfully, Kelso turned a weakness into a strength. The final strike force was comprised of F-111s and A-6s as strikers, EF-111s and EA-6Bs acting as jammers, A-7s and F-18s suppressing Libyan air defenses, and F-14s providing fleet support. USAF KC-10s and KC-135s supported the United Kingdom-based F-111s and EF-111s for air refueling and aid in navigation. The desire to minimize collateral damage drove tight rules of engagement when the air crews were allowed to release their ordnance. Vice Admiral Kelso limited the crews to a single target run. He also insisted that crews achieve 100% target identification with all onboard target acquisition systems. Crews were prohibited from dropping ordnance when aircraft malfunctions impacted precision capabilities. To maintain the element of surprise, split-second execution was essential. The time over target, TOT, was set for 0200 hours, April 15th, Libya time. Unfortunately for the F-111s, France and Spain refused overflight rights that would have led to a direct route to the Mediterranean. Rather, the F-111s had to enter the Mediterranean through the Strait of Gibraltar, which added hours of extra flight time to each leg of the mission. They flew over 6,400 miles round trip, which took 13 hours of flight time and up to 13 air refuelings. At 150 miles north of Libya, in the Mediterranean, the 6th Fleet began launching aircraft just after the stroke of midnight. The strike packages were over their targets within a few seconds of their planned TOTs. As the strike aircraft raced towards their targets, they faced a vast array of enemy air defenses. Gaddafi had purchased ZSU-23 anti-aircraft guns, SA-2, SA-3, SA-6, and SA-8 batteries and French Crutal missiles. Having been on alert since April 3rd, 
The Libyan air defense gunners on the night of the strike were more fatigued than ready. The Libyan air defense operators who did turn on their radars were quickly hammered by high-speed anti-radiation missiles, HARM, fired by the F-A-18s and A-7s. One Navy pilot commented, if they turned them on to guide their missiles, they would get a harm down their throat. All of this resulted in remarkably low casualties for the strike aircraft, for only one F-111 was lost. From the Reagan administration's perspective, the raid was a success. It appears El Dorado Canyon did have an impact on international terrorism. Middle Eastern terrorism in Europe dropped almost by half in 1986, from 74 to 39 incidents. To the great relief of the Americans, bloody anti-American episodes became less common. International terrorist incidents directed at U.S. targets declined by over 25% from 1986 to 1987. Operation El Dorado Canyon demonstrated American air power capability. American aircraft were now capable of flying tremendous distances, penetrating sophisticated air defense systems, and doing so under tight ROE delivery of precision munitions against specific targets. The final lesson to be learned from Operation El Dorado Canyon is that states that sponsor terrorism have vulnerabilities that can be exploited. Such states as Libya can be coerced or punished by striking assets they value. In this case, Libyan command centers, compounds, and high-priced aircraft were destroyed. Beyond the monetary value lost, Gaddafi lost a great deal of credibility. For a dictator, credibility is undoubtedly quite important.